Perfect. Um, so my name is Lucas. I've been here for a few years now, and I want to thank all of you for including me in this. Uh, teaching what Jesus taught and explaining it and encouraging people how to live it and change their lives and be changed by Christ is why I live. That's my purpose. Everything I want stems from that. And you're including me in that today. Um, I'm not your official pastor, but I'm here because I love you and I love Christ. So um, thank you for making this possible for me. And uh, as I trust the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, which is perfect for me, um, I just ask that you, uh, you pray for me and bless me as well, because uh, if I do anything correct ever in my life, it's because of what Jesus has done in me. And uh, I just want to give my thanks to God for that. So I don't know about you guys, and hopefully you can kind of join me on this, but I didn't grow up in the church. Um, I had the occasional friend where you would spend the night at their house on a Saturday, and the deal is, if you do, you have to go with church with them on Sunday. And so, <laughs> like, okay, cool, no problem. If it's free snacks, I'm okay with it. Um, and, like, I remember a few times as a kid, I uh, went to once a Pentecostal assembly in Chilliwack, and they were running around with flags and dancing, and it was really intense, but they would sing songs about um, the blood, uh, talking about the blood of the lamb and being washed in the blood. And I don't know, but you please raise your hand if you've been there, because it terrified me. I don't know. <laughs> what, what child do you take to a place and talk about getting washed in blood? Um, the only lamb of God I knew as a teen growing up was the metal band. And that has obviously nothing to do with Jesus. So, but that, that's the world I came from. And so when... Like when Paul talks about preaching or uh, speaking in tongues, if nobody's there to explain it, it might have value for you, but it doesn't help anyone else. And nobody explained the blood of the Lamb to me. Um, it wasn't until years later of like being Christian and reading and thinking about it. I didn't even get it, but I was more okay with it because I knew Jesus. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to talk to you about Exodus 12, the first Passover, the institution of it. And... Um, it's largely about the blood of the lamb, and I was really excited to get into that because I'd never really known what that meant. People talk about it like it's a big deal, but nobody took the time, so I wanted to take the time with you. Um, perfect. So, but one thing I think I knew is that everybody understood that blood is important. It's obviously inside of you. If you don't have blood, you die. Like, <laughs> it's pretty basic. And one thing that's important to remember is like, um, like Canadian blood services, their slogan is, it's in you to give. You can give blood and still live, and someone else can live too. It's one of the best gifts you can give. Um, so even if you don't understand the spiritual concept right away, the concept of blood itself is pretty clear. But why, does it, why is it Jesus' blood that makes the difference for us? Why is that the big deal? And what about his death and resurrection and his blood makes that significant? Um, the Bible is the story of our salvation. It starts at the very beginning with Genesis, humanity's fall into sin and the struggles that we have, and it ends with the glorification of the church in Jesus Christ and the new heaven and the new earth and the new creation. And everything that happens in between is about God's perfect plan to love and save us despite us. And that's a beautiful thing to be a part of. And so understanding that the Bible is God's story of what he has done for us that we couldn't achieve uh, is important for us to hang on to. Um, so I'll read to you Exodus 12, verses 1 to 13, and it's in your pew Bibles if you want to, on page 65. Telling you it's in the pew Bible is a server, uh, sermon trick to get you to pause for a moment while I look something up. Let's check it out. <clears throat> okay, so. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is the first for you, is, uh, will be the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share with one of their nearest neighbors, having taken into account the number of people there are. If you are, de you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be a year old male without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are going to eat the meat roasted over the fire, roasted, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roasted over a fire, with the head, legs, and internal organs. 
Do not leave any of it until morning. If some is left until morning, you must burn it. And this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it with haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt, and I will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So, in order, I know we've been talking about Exodus and Egypt for a long time, but at this point, this is the final round for Egypt. This is like the, the closing act. Everything after this is going to be a new story for the people of Israel. And it's important to note, too, that in the earlier plagues, the first ones, God kind of set the people of Israel aside in like a bubble. So he had them set up on a side so he would strike down the, uh, the plague of locusts and gnats on the uh, Egyptians, but the Hebrews had their own little space that wasn't affected. Later, the Hebrews start getting affected by it too. Like they're, It's kind of at first showing that God has the power, but now the people of Israel are being included in this process too. Um, and another thing that's inci- exciting about the Passover, the entire Hebrew calendar is based around it. Everything for them starts here. This is where God takes a bunch of families for 400 years that have been slaves and turns them into a nation. Like, this is the beginning of what would become the nation of Israel, and it starts here with the Passover. So this would signify an important change in how theology at this point was done. This would be an example of what God's deliverance for all humanity would start with. It starts with sacrifice. It starts with change and leaving. There's a process that God has created. You don't reinvent the wheel. You don't, if you have something that works, you don't change it. And so if God's plan for us is perfect, you should be able to see sort of a similarity between what Jesus does for us and what happens earlier in the Old Testament. So a few important things to note when they're actually doing the Passover. They have taken the blood of the lamb. They have their little pail. And a professor of mine showed me this. I thought it was interesting. He said, don't make it a big deal, but it's cool. You take the blood, and what you do is you mark the lintel, sorry, the sides of the doorpost, and then the top, which in some ways kind of looks like you've made the sign of the cross. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing to kind of connect us to the New Testament story about uh, Jesus' sacrifice. Um, an important thing is that the blood pays for someone else's life. A life is taken to pay for the life of another person who doesn't have to die. There's an exchange, and that has to occur. Um, People are often struggling and challenged by what we understand about God's justice. If God is just, he can't just not leave crimes unpunished. The crime has to be atoned for. It has to be paid for. And for the people of Israel, at this time, the lamb paid for their sin, not them. And that's uh, very exciting for us when we get to Jesus. They had to eat the whole sacrifice. So when they had the lamb, they roasted it. They had to eat all of it. This is an important thing to remember because when God, you can't have it your way. When God tells you what he wants you to do and outlines and describes in perfect clarity how he wants you to do it, you don't get to say, I'd prefer to have stew. Right? It doesn't work like that. You can't say, oh, I prefer my meat raw for some reason. No, he said, this is, if you are my people, this is what I'm asking you to do. And he's not saying that this is like some special reason to have roast lamb, some spiritual significance. Follow me. Just like, This is the rule. And don't leave any of it left over. Like, don't try and save it for later. Don't eat it in small bites. Eat it with haste. Like, this is meant for your well-being. Don't think that you can just nibble at it and save it for later or give it away. This is for you from God. They uh, ate their Passover meal completely clothed. And I don't know if you've ever like worn a coat inside and people ask you, where are you going? And you're like, oh, I'm just chilly, whatever. No, these people were getting ready to leave. Like this is when they're like exit stage right Israel. Uh, everything is about to change for them. And it's to remind these people that you're not hanging out, right? This is, you're eating and leaving. Like there's no, either you are gonna come with us, the train is leaving the station. If you're not on the train, you're not going where the train is going. So be prepared. Follow what the Lord has commanded. Be ready to go. Um, and another, there's two more important points about the Passover itself. The bitter herbs. Part of the rule is that you have to eat the bitter herbs. 
to remind you of the bitterness of everything you're leaving behind. Your slavery, your bondage, your pain, your fear, your agony. The, the pain of seeing your grandparents struggle under the whip of the Egyptians. All that is behind you. Don't forget it, but it's behind you. And another, if you guys are interested as you read the chapter, it talks a lot about unleavened bread. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get it. I studied, I looked it up, and as best as I could tell, it's important. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to give you like special spiritual significance talking about Jesus and the leaven of the Pharisees. I don't want to make connections that I don't think are there. But half the chapter is don't eat leavened bread. So I want you guys to at least acknowledge for the people of Israel and God teaching them, that was a big deal. It's perhaps a little bit beyond my grasp as a 20th century white guy, but that's just how it was. Um, but what does this mean to us? We're not, we're not Hebrews, I think. <laughs> we're Christians. So what does it mean? It's interesting to hear history. I love it. Dean loves it. I don't know if you do. What does it mean to us as Christians? How do we care about this? So the Jewish people had their own understanding of what the Messiah was like. In the same way, like in, when they were in Egypt, crying out to God for deliverance under slavery. In first century Palestine, they were crying out to God to get rid of the Romans. All they wanted, the Messiah that their preachers talked about but maybe didn't teach about, was their victorious Davidic king who would come in and sweep out the Romans and install the kingdom of Israel and change everybody's lives and everybody gets gold hats and everybody wins except the Romans. Like that's what people wanted. They wanted the immediate satisfaction of their salvation how they expect it. And so instead of the lion of Judah roaring in like they think he will, Jesus comes in like a more like a gentle lamb. And that confuses people. It confuses us when we think of like, like fit, clean-shaved beard, white Jesus that we see in old books sometimes. It's not what Jesus looked like, but that's what we think of. We have to make sure that our perceptions aren't what we want, but what the scripture has to say and what God is teaching us. Because as long as we're looking for our own message in the scriptures, we're never going to find God. We're trying to make our own God to suit our purposes. So, another, so the people of Israel didn't have fast, cheap entertainment like we do. They didn't spend all day on YouTube looking at cats. Nobody, <laughs> no Pharisee got up and like dropped some bombs and said, yo, like, comment, and subscribe, right? That never happened. Nobody ever did that. But they were a really close-knit community. And the important thing that they did was talk to each other about what they believed. Like uh, their histories, their culture, their stories. That was the integrity and the unity of this people. All they had was the scriptures. So they all knew the story of the, of the uh, Passover every year. Like it's kind of like how we do with Christmas. Um, we sometimes watch the Christmas Carol. It's kind of like understand a bit about spiritual significance, but for them, it was a big deal. Like this was how their community stayed together. And it must have terrified them when Jesus walked up after already having the Passover with them a few times to finally say, and this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And this is my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the Passover dinner, he's ba he is telling them what this lamb achieved, I'm going to achieve for you. That's terrifying. <laughs> like, nobody makes, like, that doesn't make any sense. And I want you guys to know that, because there's a few traditions that talk about Jesus' blood that we actually eat and drink his blood. Nobody in first century Israel thought that. T the idea of eating a person was just absurd. Nobody would have believed that. Nobody would have drank in Jesus' blood. Um, it would have gone against everything that they upheld in their law. So I just want you guys to know the scriptures say it's not as complicated. There's important spiritual significance to this. But he's not asking you to be a cannibal. Some people have told me that. I <laughs> set you guys straight. So how does Jesus connect to the Passover? How do we... He said he is in sort of a spiritual sense. But what does that even mean to us? So... When Jesus is on the cross, and this is after everybody's already heard that, that he's kind of taking that spiritual place, um, while he's on the cross, they give him a bit of wine on a hyssop branch in John 19, verse 29. And hyssop was just like a leafy branch, kind of commonly grown. You could find it just about anywhere. And it was usually used in like a temple circumstance when you were cleansing something. The hyssop branch was kind of the tool you had. That's what the Israelites marked their doorposts with. They marked it with the hyssop branch. And for any Hebrew 
after hearing Jesus talk about being the Passover, to see him on the cross and have somebody raise up a hyssop branch to him? They would have got it. They would have said, wait, that's like the Passover. Why did that happen? And then after he had died, he's no longer in control of what's happening around him. They break the bones of the other Jews on the crosses. And that was common. When you're being crucified, you're either in agony or you can't breathe and still in agony. And you just rotate until you die. And so if they had to get people out quicker, they would break their legs so they couldn't breathe anymore. They had to like, sink down lower. And that was it. But when they went up to Jesus, he was already dead. So they didn't have to break his legs. <laughs> and then when you get to Exodus 12, 49... They, the, the statute, the sort of the legal little snippet of what the uh, Passover ought to be, it says the, like the, the bones of the lamb will not be broken. Do not break the bones. It's part of the Passover. And that's uncommon. Back then, everybody would have broken the bones to get the marrow. That would have been a common thing. Lots of people do it still. But don't do it with the Passover, especially, specifically for this. Don't do it. But they didn't break Jesus' bones. And they got him with the hyssop branch. And he said he's the Passover. What do I do with that? Like, that would have been incredible. That would have been life-changing to see the man that you saw people bring back from the dead and heal the poor, uh, <laughs> heal the poor, but, like, preach to the poor and save tax collectors and, like, cure the blind is now, even after he died and, like, no longer in control of his circumstances, people are still bringing it to him. And these are specific to Jesus. No one else gets a special treatment. Nobody else had all of these elements together the way that Jesus did. So instead of marking our homes with blood to protect our family for a day, Jesus protects us with his blood on our souls and our spirits and ourselves forever. I want you guys to kind of think about that. How many lambs had to die at the first Passover and every technically Passover since then? Thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands to save a people for one night. The blood of one man saves his entire people forever. When we hear like lines in songs like, worthy is the lamb who is slain, if a perfect unblemished lamb can pass over, that cause God to pass over you, how much more is the worthiness of Jesus' blood taking that spiritual role as the lamb of God to save us from our sins forever? Like, one and done. That's it. Finished. No more. So I want to ask you guys a question. Are you free? Because we're not born that way. We're not born free. We're all stuck in sin somehow. And mine isn't better than yours or worse than yours. It kills us all. Right? It's like <laughs> you go to like a chemotherapy ward, and everybody's talking about whose cancer's worse. Nobody says that. They don't want to get better. Everybody wants to be free from the bondage and the pain and the agony and the fear of death. So are you free? Do you want to be free? It's an important question to ask. The, the Israelites had lived in Egypt for hundreds of years. They had built cities and been making bricks for generations. Family business now. And they're good at it, clearly. Right? So if you're really good in your captivity, in your bondage, you get comfortable with it, you get used to it, it's all you know, or what you're, you know, comfortable with. Do you want to be free? Do you want to change? Have you grown so used to the irons around your wrist that you don't want to take them off? Do you want to be free if it means that you have to leave behind everything you think you know? Because Jesus doesn't talk about anything less than that. There are no provisions in Scripture where you get to take a day trip to the kingdom of God and then go back to the life that you wanted to have. That's it. The train's gone. Either you are on it and you're going to the kingdom of heaven, or you're not. There's two choices. And that's tough. That's really tough. Because I want to be rich, maybe. Or I want everyone to love me, maybe. Or I want to... I don't go with lots of women. Or like there's lots of things in this life that kind of snag at us and we want to be a part of and we see everybody else having fun, so we want to jump in. Do I want that more than I want Jesus? Because he says I have to deny myself. I have to take up my cross of living out his teachings and follow him. 
There's no, <laughs> there's only one way to go. All of Egypt was going to be plagued, all of it, everybody, including the Israelites. And it was because of the blood of the lamb that they were allowed to live. That's what caused God to do it. And we know from John 3 that the whole world already stands condemned. And it is only because of Jesus' perfect sacrifice, his perfect atonement, that any of us who believe have any chance of living. The, lamb, <laughs> the blood of the lamb atones for sin for a short time. And the blood of the lamb of God atones for sin for all time. So the joy of preaching beyond desiring to be terrified every once in a while um, is when you encounter God's word, it changes you. You can't go back. If somebody told you an, un, like, an irrefutable proof that lies in your heart, you can pretend to ignore it, but you still know it's there. So as I grow closer to God, as I learn about the scriptures, as I grow closer to God and change, and he changes me, um, the, the power of what he does in me grows. So now when I hear about the blood, I want to praise God. I want to thank Jesus that instead of every single day offering sacrifices, I mean, like many of us take medications every day to ensure our health or even to live. Every day that's what the Hebrews had to do. They had to give guilt offerings and sin offerings constantly because sin is always there. And Jesus just goes in, pulls it out, <laughs> throws it away, and gives you something new. Do you want to be made new? That's it. Jesus doesn't take something that's broken, put a Band-Aid on it and some spiritual duct tape, and hope for the best. Right? No, nope, defective. Here's your warranty. You're done. Get out of here. Like, this part is finished for you. Being saved, knowing Jesus, coming to faith is the first step. It's a big step, but it's the first step. But until we're glorified in Christ in the new kingdom, we still have to live out our faith with each other. Right? We still have to encourage each other and uplift each other and spend time with each other. And that's hard sometimes because I see other people doing it wrong and I want to just get them. <laughs> like I want to hug them and I want to shake them. Like kind of both. Um, it comes up a lot because I care. But that's not always the right way. You will, if you're asking yourself in your heart, if you're free, if you want to be free or if you're struggling, you're going to experience the kingdom of God and the power of grace and salvation. When you look at that person who hurt you years ago and say, I'm, I'm, I know that you'll never say you're sorry, but I forgive you because I don't want to feel like this anymore. Jesus doesn't want me to be broken and crippled by my sin. I spent so much time hating myself for everything I've ever thought that I've ever done or that has been done to me. But the truth about Jesus is that when you become a Christian, when you are blessed by that Holy Spirit and you come to faith, all that is gone. It is like a dream that you wake up from and you were terrified or angry or fighting or running or wealthy or whatever. It's gone. You have a new reality in Christ. You have a new life. And just the same way that you were afraid before or you'd hurt people before, that is removed from you. That is gone forever. And you were set free. So why do people keep trying to go to sleep? After you wake up and you know the truth, and it sounds silly, but the matrix comes to mind, that if you learn that everything you've ever experienced was a lie and just meant to control you, to make you feel certain ways to do certain things, you wake up and you know it's a lie. Why would you ever, ever want to go back? You're free. You don't stand by your broken chains and quickly try and get them back on. No, you run. You run to Jesus every time. You fall. You get back up. You get lost. You ask for help, and he brings you closer every time. Being closer to Jesus and praying and reading the Bible is a little bit like telling people that if you work out and go to the gym, you'll get healthy. It makes sense, but it doesn't work unless you do it. You have to do these things, and your life will change forever. So I want you guys to be blessed by this. I want you to spend some time and read your scriptures and come to faith and understand it because it will change every part of who you are. And you'll forgive people of sins that you didn't know that they'd done against you. And you'll go up to people you've hurt and ask for forgiveness. And there's nothing lighter than falling asleep gently, knowing you're loved, and knowing you have nothing to hide. 
You don't have to tell people stories anymore. You don't have to lie anymore. This is what being washed by the blood of the Lamb means. This is what the spiritual significance of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection is. This life doesn't have spiritual power over me anymore. I am free. And whoever the Son sets free will be free indeed. So please pray with me. Uh, Lord, I thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. I ask that you give us patience and kindness and joy and discipline and self-control. I ask that you reveal in our hearts your truth and that you point to us where you want us to go. If you want us to rest, Lord, please help us rest. We're so tired. If you want us to run, Lord, please help us run to you. And in everything, Lord, may your name be glorified. May your son be glorified. And may our spirits be blessed by you. And so as, amen. And so as we leave here today, carry that with you. Think about it. Dwell on it. Read your scriptures. If you want to get closer to Jesus, read Isaiah 53. Read Psalm 22. And then read about the crucifixion. It'll change everything that you feel. And you'll never be the same. But you have to ask yourself, do I want that? Do I really want to live a different life? Thank you.